the initiative is driving the most robust discourse about Congress with the goal of strengthening representative government and protecting liberty. Most of all, I would like to thank um, Jen, Jen Weinberg. Um, she's the co-president of the Federal Society, or, or more accurately, I would be her co-president. Um, and her attention to detail and thoroughness is continually teaching me new things uh, every day. And I'd like to introduce... I would like to introduce our, our speaker, uh, elected in 2010 as Utah's 16th senator, Mike Lee has spent his career defending the basic liberties of Americans and Utahs as tireless advocate for our founding constitutional principles. Senator Lee acquired a deep respect for the Constitution early on. His father, Rex Lee, who served as a solicitor general under President Ronald Reagan, would often discuss varied aspects of judicial and constitutional doctrine around the kitchen table, from due process to the uses of executive, plen executive plenary power. <coughs> he attended most of his father's arguments before the US Supreme Court, giving him a unique hands-on experience and understanding of government from up close. Lee graduated from Brigham Young University with a Bachelor of Science in Political Science and served as BYU's student body president in his senior year. He graduated from BYU's law school in 1997 and went on to serve as law clerk to Judge Dee Benson of the U.S. District Court for the District of Utah. And then with future Supreme Court Justice Judge Samuel Alito on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit. Lee spent several years as an attorney from the law, at the law firm Sidley and Austin specializing in appellate and Supreme Court litigation and then served as an assistant U.S. attorney in Salt Lake arguing cases before the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Tenth Circuit. Lee served the state of Utah as Governor John Huntsman's general counsel and was later honored to reunite with Justice Alito, now sitting on the Supreme Court for a one-year clerkship. He returned to private practice in 2007. Throughout his career, Lee has earned a reputation as an outstanding practitioner of the law based on his sound judgment, abilities in the courtroom, and thorough understanding of the Constitution. Today, Lee fights to preserve America's proud founding document in the United States Senate. He advocates efforts to support constitutionally limited government, fiscal responsibility, individual liberty, and economic prosperity. Lee is a member of the Judiciary Committee and serves as chairman of the Antitrust Competition Policy and Consumer Rights Subcommittee, protecting business competition and personal freedom. He also oversees issues critical to Utah as the chairman of the Water and Power Subcommittee of the Energy and Natural Resources Committee and serves on the Commerce Committee as well. In 2019, Lee became the chairman of the Joint Economic Committee, where he is overseeing the Social Capital Project. Lee and his wife, Sharon, live in Alpine, Utah with their three children. He is a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and served a two-year mission for the church in the Texas Rio Grande Valley. Thank you. It's my pleasure now to introduce Senator Lee. Okay. Thanks so much, Neil. Uh, thanks to all of you for uh, for joining me tonight. I, um, I I'm I'm a little overwhelmed by uh, the, the fact that I I got applause when I walked in. In this town, that literally does not happen. Um, in the real America, sometimes it does. But uh, uh, I, I'm very grateful uh, for the invitation to be here. I, I first met Neil a few years ago, and he and I have. Um, have corresponded by email and text occasionally, and, and, and I've enjoyed getting to know him. I've enjoyed getting to know the Federalist Society uh, for my entire adult life. I actually first started attending Federalist Society events when I was in high school. Uh, and yes, I really was that big of a loser. <clears throat> the first Federalist Society event I ever attended was uh, either my sophomore or junior year in high school. Uh, Judge Robert Bork of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit was speaking at our local law school in, in Provo, Utah, and uh, I decided to organize an outing for our Teenage Republican Club at Timview High School, and we went down there and watched Judge Bork. It was fantastic. Uh, but uh, the Federalist Society has been a significant part of my life and my career ever since then. I've really enjoyed it. Years after that, uh, many decades later, when I would run for the United States Senate, um, uh, when I first started thinking about uh, a run for the Senate, somebody asked me once whether I would ever run for federal office. And I said, yeah, maybe, but 
I don't really think so because I don't think I'm electable. And he asked why. And I said, because if I were ever to run, I would run on a campaign that would be predicated on federalism and separation of powers, on textualism and originalism. And that would bore people silly. And those not bored silly by it would be frightened by it. And I it would be unelectable. Um, never accept a dare. I, that's all I'm going to say there. Um, but but I, I ended up giving a series of speeches around the state of Utah, sort of in an effort to call my friend's bluff when he said, no, I think you could be elected on that. And um, little by little, the, the, the message cut on. And I, I ended up getting elected to the US Senate in 2010. I was, I was 39 years old at the time I was elected, which made me feel like sort of an outcast, one of many reasons why I would feel that way when I arrived here. Um, uh, I was the youngest senator at the time. I, I took the oath of office. I've got Marco Rubio by exactly seven days. He's, <laughs> he's one week older than I am. But I, I literally got carded every time I, I approached the Senate chamber to vote. And I, I, as a non-drinking kid from Utah, I'm, I'm not used to getting carded. <clears throat> I had a little more hair back then. But, but uh, these guys were not interested in seeing my driver's license. I'll, I'll show you what, what I had to show them in order to convince them that I, uh, in fact, had a right to be there. Um, it's this little card, or, or its predecessor. It's, it's, it has my name on it. It says that I'm a United States Senator representing Utah. The original version of it had uh, an inscription that said, expiration January 3rd, 2017. And I had to assure my wife and our three children that that was not the date I would personally expire, just my term of <laughs> office. But these guys would actually look at these, these heavily armed uh, policemen outside the Capitol and then outside the Senate chamber within the Capitol would actually stop and look at it as if to examine it to make sure that it wasn't a fake ID that I had bought in Georgetown or something. <clears throat> or at Georgetown Law School, maybe that's. <laughs> and and, and they, would, they would look at it, they would examine it, and then they'd say, I guess we're going to have to let them in. And this would go on. This went on for months after I got here. Finally, I mentioned to one of my colleagues that this was happening. And I said, how long is it going to be before I no longer get carded? And the, the colleague said, um, well, it's because you're not wearing your pin. What pin? And then I remember they had given me a, a lapel pin when I was sworn into office. I, I'm not into that sort of thing. So I put it in the, in the desk drawer and closed the drawer and forgot all about it. Uh, but he said, if you wear the lapel pin, they won't card you. Apparently, this little pin is worn only by senators. Who knew? So I put it on, and it worked like a charm. So much so that I, I affectionately named it my sorry senator pin. Because when I get carded, if I point to the pin, they'll, they'll say, oh, sorry, senator, you can come on in. <laughs> One time uh, after I'd, I'd been in the Senate for quite some time, I was on the Senate floor in between votes. And I had one arm gently resting on the desk in front of me. And I was thinking about how the vote was going to turn out. One of the non-uniformed cops comes up to me inside the Senate chamber and says in a very harsh tone of voice, excuse me, sir, will you please not lean on the senator's desk? It was weird the way you said it, but you know, whatever. I, I said, I'm terribly sorry. I, I didn't realize I was push it, putting any pressure on the desk. It won't happen again. You see, they're really touchy about the desks because most of them are original equipment, which means uh, most of them date back to at least 1859 when the, the current Senate wing of the Capitol was completed. Some of them date back to the 1830s, which means they are all, almost as old as some of my colleagues in the Senate. <laughs> and. Uh, but this wasn't enough for the guy. After I told him I won't put any weight on it, he continued to cross-examine me. Uh, he then asked me, are, are you with the minority? You know, Republicans were the minority party at the time. And I said, what do you mean on this vote or the next? Sometimes my party gets it wrong. I, I don't know why we're, you're asking this. And then he said, no, are, uh, are, are, are you with the minority leader? And I said, well, what do you mean? I, I, this was really freaking me out. It was a, some kind of loyalty test. Mitch McConnell is our minority leader. Now we're majority leader, of course. But, uh, what do you mean? And he said, no, are you part of the minority leader's staff? And then I realized, OK, that, this explains all of it. So um, I you know, wanted to spare him the agony. I just pointed to the pin, and it, uh, it got me only a blank stare. So I realized I was going to have to use my title, which I didn't like to do. I still don't like to do it. It makes me uncomfortable. You know how you, w w when you're saying something you don't want to have to say, you sometimes mumble it, or at least I do? Don't ever do that in court, by the way. But um, so I kind of mumbled it. I, I said, "I'm I'm Senator Lee," 
said, what? And I said, okay, my name is Mike Lee. I represent a state called Utah. It's sort of squarish. It resembles a chair. It's in the Rocky Mountains. Lovely skiing. And at that point, he figured out who I was. And all the color seemed to drain from his face as he told me in one hurried breath, I'm terribly sorry for the misunderstanding, sir. My name is Steve, if you want to report me. And then he ran for the door. <laughs> but look, I, I felt bad for Steve. This was an honest mistake. And uh, so I chased after him because I didn't want him beating himself up over it. But alas, Steve was too fast. <laughs> so from then on until the day he retired, uh, every time I saw Steve in the hall, I'd stop and wave to him, talk to him, and I'd say, hi, Steve. And uh, then I realized after he retired a few years ago, his name's probably not Steve. Um, <laughs> It's probably Bob. Steve's a guy he works with who he doesn't care much for. <laughs> I like telling that story in part because it reminds me of um, the fact that we have certain things that belong to us that are ours, but they have to be properly asserted, even when it's difficult, sometimes especially when it's difficult. And if we fail to assert them as ours, they will cease to be ours. They will cease to be meaningful. Had I not asserted my right to be there that day, even though I didn't want to have to use my title, I didn't want to have to assert my right, it should have just been a self-evident, or the sorry Senator Penn should have done the speaking for me. It didn't. I would have lost something. I would have lost my ability to do my job, my ability to represent the 3.2 million people I represent. And um, some of my colleagues probably would have been all too eager to see me hauled off in cuffs only to tell them later he's actually a member. But... Uh, th there, there is an analogy there that applies not just to senators or just to elected officials, but to all of us in the sense that just by virtue of the fact that we exist, the fact that we live and breathe on U.S. soil, and the fact that we're citizens, we have certain things that are properly ours, but we have to assert them. Many of what you consider your constitutional rights, or at least some of them, are today more or less self-executing in the sense that they might speak for themselves. And what I mean by that is the odds are pretty high that if you get pulled over for a traffic ticket tonight, the cop is not going to ask for proof of whether you went to church on Sunday or to synagogue on Saturday or, or wherever else and whatever else you might worship. If that does happen, please call me. They're not allowed to do that. Um, there are other rights that are sufficiently self-executing that you can more or less count on them. The quartering of troops, now I'm not going to go there. Uh, you're, you're probably not going to be subjected to the rack if you are imprisoned in this country. You probably will be offered a lawyer. These things are self-executing for the time being in the sense that they're sufficiently widely observed that you almost don't have to go out of your way to make sure that they're honored. But not every constitutional protection is like that. In fact, w what I think of as the core protection, the headwaters of all other constitutional protections, are widely disregarded. Nowhere more than in this city. And of course, what I'm referring to here are the, the twin structural protections of the Constitution. The vertical protection we call federalism, and the horizontal protection we call separation of powers. I say they're core. They're, they're headwater protections in the following sense. Nothing else in the Constitution, including the, the, the thou shalt nots of the Bill of Rights, means anything unless you have something in place to make sure that no one person and no one group of people may acquire too much authority within our constitutional system. As Justice Scalia used to put it, any tin horn dictator around the world can have a Bill of Rights. And most tin horn dictators do have a Bill of Rights. Most of those Bills of Rights actually look really nice. They stack up quite favorably when measured in the abstract in a vacuum compared to ours. By the way, I have to note here, parenthetically, I really don't know what the difference is between a tin horn dictator and a regular dictator. Um, looks like there was this SNL clip a few years ago. I think written by my former colleague Al Franken, uh, it said, you know, one day when you die, if you go to heaven, you might be given a choice between regular heaven and pie heaven. And it might be a trick, but if it's not, pie heaven really could be a good thing. But I digress. Tin horn dictator versus regular dictator. I don't know what the difference is, and Justice Scalia is not here 
to ask anymore. But uh, either way, his point is simple. A dictator can have a Bill of Rights, and most of them do, but it really doesn't mean anything because it's a dictator. And even in the absence of a dictatorship, a despot, you, you, you still have every possibility, in fact, every likelihood that your fundamental rights as a human being are going to be disregarded if there's nothing in place making sure that no one person and no one group of people may exercise too much power. That's why our founding fathers very wisely put in place this system that said our federal government, our national government, is only going to have those powers that we recognize as distinctively, unavoidably, and by constitutional mandate uh, are national. Weights and measures, trademarks, copyrights, and patents, bankruptcy laws, naturalization laws, uh, uh, the, the, the power to regulate trade between the several states with foreign nations and with the Indian tribes, the power to declare war, and you know, there's always my favorite, right, the, the, the power, the, uh, the power to grant letters of mark and reprisal. Uh, it's one of the few places where I can talk about letters of mark and reprisal and have people know what I mean. But someday I am going to get a letter of mark and reprisal and I'm going to have a pirate and a skull and crossbones flag and you're all invited to join me. <laughs> but those powers are, are, are limited. They, they can and do fit within the four corners of the document. And, and nearly all of those powers fit within Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, which we too infrequently discuss. And then we've inflated a couple of Congress's power, powers, including the Spending Clause and the Commerce Clause, to the point that it's very difficult to distinguish between a power that is reserved to the states or to the people on the one hand, and a power that is national or federal in nature. I think this is unfortunate. And I think a lot of this can be traced back to a, a fateful, shameful day, April 12, 1937, that's when the Supreme Court effectively amended the Constitution in a really fundamental way, I would add, by converting the Commerce Clause into the affecting interstate commerce clause. You, you can say what you want about whether or not uh, the court was on the right track in terms of direct <coughs> versus indirect regulation of commerce, or whether or not the court had practical reasons for doing what it did. But it was a shameful moment in the sense that it represented an abdication of the court's power to say what the law is and to say what is federal and what is not federal. Because nearly anything that you can dream, if, if you can dream it, you can regulate it through Congress, through the Commerce Clause, under that very expansive definition. And this ultimately is something that's neither Republican nor Democratic, neither liberal nor conservative. It, it, it is simply a, a constitutional structural problem. And sadly, we've continued that march away from federalism ever since April 12, 1937, that day when the Supreme Court decided to NLRB versus Jones and Laughlin Steel. Uh, what the court had in mind that day, I, I believe, uh, other than Owen Roberts squishing out and, and you know, uh, taking credit, uh, the, sh the shift in time that, saves, that saved nine. Wh what the court really was doing was saying as a practical matter, we don't really want to deal with this issue. We want it ironed out within the political branches. And in fact, the opinion itself and its successor uh, decided four or five years later in Wickard v. Filburn embraces that same philosophy. We're not saying that anything and everything is interstate commerce. We're just saying that as long as it fits roughly within these parameters, uh, uh, we're going to defer to the political branches to decide what fits within that. Well, how did that work out for us? Congress didn't view the subtlety in the light that one might have intended it from the Supreme Court's perspective. In fact, Congress has seen this as a perpetually green light the same way that you might have viewed it if uh, your parents, while you were in high school, left town and said, the liquor in the wine cabinet uh, are over here. Uh, they're unlocked. Here are the keys to the car. Have fun. And I'm, I, I trust that you will use your own judgment wisely. Uh, my guess is that if, and if your, your parents did that, uh, they probably later regretted that decision. Um, <coughs> 
and I think we've reached a point where the Supreme Court, looking back at the fact that since 1937, the court has only twice concluded that Congress exceeded its power under the Commerce Clause. It's arguably two and a half times if you can't NFIB versus Sebelius, but you really can't because then they went on to create this, uh, this um, spending clause theory that really makes no sense and that uh, uh, we could talk about for an entire hour. I, I wrote a, a, after NFIB versus Sebelius was decided, I was so upset, I went back and um, retreated into a cave and just started writing because I was angry. I ended up writing an e-book called Why John Roberts Was Wrong About Healthcare. Um, I haven't been invited to the Supreme Court Christmas party since then, but <laughs> all 12 people who read why John Roberts was wrong about health care really enjoyed it. Uh, <clears throat> so as, as the Supreme Court said, yeah, anything goes, and gave Congress what Congress interpreted as, as, as a perpetually green light, Congress all of a sudden found itself with all of these powers that it had previously not had, the power to regulate what we would regard as more or less local activities, even if economic, uh, activities taking place within one state at one time. Things like labor, manufacturing, agriculture, and mining all of a sudden became fodder, uh, be, 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 became appropriate for federal legislation. And as that happened, Congress started realizing, holy cow, we've got a lot of power. We're going to have to vote on a lot of stuff. Voting on a lot of stuff is hard especially because we're going to have to engage in countless line drawing exercises in deciding exactly uh, how we're going to regulate things like labor, manufacturing, agriculture, and mining. And so it became easier for Congress to delegate that power, to enact laws that aren't really laws in and of themselves, but are more platitudinal statements. Things like we shall have good law in area X and we hereby delegate to department or commission uh, or division Y, the power to make and interpret and enforce good law in area X. In other words, it gave rise to the modern administrative state. This made it easier. When somebody's ox got gouged or mired by a regulation, it made it easier for members of Congress to say, Psh, uh, don't look at me for that. I didn't vote for that. I, ju I just voted for good law in area X. What idiot's going to disagree with that? We, we've got modern examples, the things that have, have been enacted uh, uh, in the last 40 or 50 years of this, things that have been very popular and in many respects successful. Take, for example, the Clean Air Act. Relatively popular legislation. It's widely regarded as, as relatively successful in seeking to do what it did. And yet if you read it, this is a slight oversimplification, but makes the point, and I think it's a fair one, it in effect said, we hereby declare we shall have clean air. What idiot's going to vote against that? And we hereby give the EPA the power to decide what clean air is, what appropriate levels of pollution are, and what penalties will befall polluters who exceed those limits that the EPA imposes. Now, again, to be clear, the Clean Air Act has, in fact, help clean up the air, and it is relatively popular. The problem with it is it, there are all kinds of line drawing decisions that have to be made within it. Are we going to focus more on mobile sources like automobiles or stationary sources like power plants? Uh, and and uh, exactly how are we going to find violations of this, and who is it going to hurt? How is this going to hurt your poor and middle class rate payer? And will the poor or middle class rate pay payer understand the extent to which he or she is paying for the higher costs? How will those be translated to them? And, and how will they be disclosed? All kinds of decisions like these are then made by executive branch bureaucrats, which is fine in the sense that these are people who, by and large, are well-educated, well-intentioned, hardworking, and highly specialized. The problem is you can't fire them. They don't work for you. If you live in Utah, you can fire me every six years. If you live in Utah, you can, you can fire uh, you, the, my counterparts in the House from Utah every two years if you live in their district. 
you cannot fire an executive branch bureaucrat. No one can. It's almost impossible. And so this has create, created a weird dynamic, one in which we've taken power away from the American people in two steps. Step one, from the people to Washington, D.C. Step two, within Washington, D.C., from the people's elected lawmakers to unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats. This has been really good for a handful of people. It's actually really good for members of our profession who profit to a significant degree on the basis of ambiguity and uncertainty and complexity within the law. It's really good for those who are close to the centers of power. As of a few years ago, six of our nation's 10 wealthiest counties were suburbs of Washington, D.C. This is a lovely area. Aside from everything else, it's home to George Washington Law School, which is just awesome. Lovely museums, some great buildings, good architecture, art, great restaurants, and fantastic law students. But this is an area that, while lovely, manufactures nothing. It's not a tech hub. It's not a banking hub. There are no gold mines here. The money is here only because the power is here, concentrated in the hands of a few elites. If you're one of those elites, it might be good for you. But poor middle class America pays for the cost of regulatory compliance to the tune of about $2 trillion a year. This makes everything the American people buy more expensive. It especially affects the poor and middle class who are least in a position to discern that everything they're buying becomes more expensive and that they might also be paying for that through diminished wages, unemployment, and underemployment. In this respect, this is really a populist issue, but it's a populist issue that's been hidden from the American people for a really long time. When I was in law school, uh, I first remember talking about this issue and talking about how the modern administrative regulatory state affected the poor and middle class about 22, 23 years ago. And, and at the time, uh, someone informed me that the uh, Regulatory compliance costs with federal regulations annually were about uh, $300 billion a year. This, is, it, it was explained to me, is sort of like a, a tax increase, but it's a tax increase that's invisible. You don't file a return at the end of the year uh, to help you be informed about what it's costing you. You don't ever see it printed on a receipt. It's just hidden in everything you buy, and yet it's a kind of backdoor invisible tax. That number has ballooned, it's mushroomed some sevenfold since then. And it has done so in a way that has left the American people without the benefit of that to which they're entitled. Uh, their right to live in a place where federalism and separation of powers restrict who may exercise power and how much of it and how that power is to be exercised. To limit the size, scope, reach, and cost of the federal government and then within that government, uh, the allocation of power between the branch that makes the law, the branch that interprets the law, and the branch that enforces it. This is an issue that the Federalist Society has been at the forefront of advocating, at least in the, in the judicial branch of government. Uh, I think the time has come in which the Federalist Society is branching out it can and it should have an influence that extends into the political branches. This is why I was thrilled when the Federalist Society came out with this, uh, this Article I initiative a few years ago. Incidentally, I started something called the Article I Project right before the Federalist Society launched it. Um, I'm convinced that Leonard Leo uh, used mind control um, powers to, uh, to figure out that I was doing it. But he approached me just as I was launching mine and said, we were about to launch our own Article I project. And I said, go ahead, the more the merrier. Uh, th th the point of this was to emphasize the fact that we need lawmakers to start focusing on core issues, including and especially separation of powers. Because in both political parties, under the failed leadership of House of Representatives, Senates, and White Houses of every conceivable partisan combination, we have shifted more and more power from the people to Washington and within uh, Washington from the people's elected lawmakers over to unelected, unaccountable bureaucrats. We started scanning the horizon looking for various ways in which we have outsourced the lawmaking power 
to the other branches, especially to Article 2, especially to the executive branch. We've discussed how that happens in regulatory policy. We've done it in trade policy. There are dozens of provisions of federal law in which we've handed over lock, stock, and barrel the power to start a trade war. That's supposed to not happen without an affirmative vote of Congress. We've done it with the war power over and over again uh, by having the atrophy of Congress's legislative muscle uh, set in when Congress doesn't invoke the War Powers Act and doesn't assert its right to declare war and has instead deferred, again, uh, 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 through every partisan combination imaginable to whatever the chief executive decides to do at any given moment. Remember just a few years ago when we became mired in a conflict in Libya, albeit indirectly, uh, as a result of a presidential decision, a presidential decision on which we were not consulted. We were given sort of drive-by notification, but that was it. Uh, a few years later, we became involved in a civil war in Yemen involving the Houthi rebels. This is a, a war that we've never declared. It, there's no authorization for the use of military force, and yet we've gone there. We can restore federalism and separation of powers. These are concepts that are not beyond the cognitive capabilities of the American people, but we have to make them a political issue again. The only way they're going to work their way into the political branches of government is if we make these issues part of our national political discourse. The American people have proven more than capable of incorporating a constitutional framework into their political decision making in other areas. We talk about the religion clauses, we talk about uh, uh, freedom of speech and of the, of the press in our constitutional framework. If those things, why not federalism and separation of powers? They're broader, they're actually simpler, we can do it. <clears throat> That's why I'm here this evening. Uh, I, I'm always trying to speak to anyone who will listen uh, about these concepts. And, uh, and, and that goes to people at every end every point along the political continuum. Spoken until I'm blue in the face, not just to my Republican colleagues, but to my Democratic colleagues, explaining to them why they should be all about federalism and separation of powers as well. Most of the people in Vermont would much prefer a single-payer government-run, government-funded health care system. It's one of the reasons I will never live in Vermont. <laughs> but they could get there much faster, much more effectively, much more completely if the federal government didn't occupy such a huge footprint in health care. We can get there, but we have to reincorporate these things into our discussion. Thank you for joining me. Thanks for listening to me today. Okay, I've, I've left uh, about, um, actually that's presumptuous of me. Can I do a Q&A? Yeah. Are you okay with that? Okay. Um, I've left about 20 minutes before I have to leave. Uh, I'll ha be happy to answer any questions about law, politics, or gardening, or fashion, relationship <laughs> advice. Yes, sir. Hello. Yeah. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm Michael. I'm a 3L here at George Washington. And I got to say, um, I'm, I'm, the, I'm one of the lefties who came, but I'm very interested in your work with Senator Sanders on Yemen. Um, I'm feeling the burn. And I'm, thank you. Well, <laughs> so I'm very tempted to ask you this. Um, put Ukraine gate aside, put Russia gate aside. Is it worth an impeachment inquiry, or is it worth some more strong actions against Trump on the issues of going to war without constitutional authorization? And, and, and where have we done that under this president? Under this president, I mean, beyond the War Powers Act, would you be in favor of an impeachment inquiry in terms of illegal, waging illegal war? No, uh, he hasn't done that. I mean, uh, look, he's continued the unconstitutional, undeclared war in Yemen, um, but that's not impeachment worthy, especially because you've had a Congress who's, that's continued to fund it. Uh, the, he's just left in motion what was already set in motion previously. I wouldn't have and did not support impeachment for Barack Obama for getting us involved in that. I, I wouldn't now. You, you've got to reserve impeachment power uh, for uh, a pretty significant abuse of power. This isn't that. If we were going to exercise that power for the Yemen fiasco, it would have been for Obama, but I, I wasn't in favor of that now. I certainly wouldn't be for this. As to the Ukraine stuff, uh, look, it, you, you and I might disagree on that, but um, 
he hasn't done anything even remotely impeachable. Uh, President Trump, uh, in that conversation uh, involving uh, the President and President Zelensky, he successfully called for the investigation of Burisma. This was the position that had been advocated for years by the U.S. government, starting with the Obama administration. President Trump succeeded where the Obama administration had tried but failed to bring about an investigation of Burisma. That's what I see. But um, on the war power stuff, though, President Trump is the most dovish, least hawkish, and in that respect, the most respectful president of the war power that we've had in modern history. This drives my liberal colleagues nuts when I point this out to them because they know it's true. Every other president, almost without exception in my lifetime, would have taken us to war under similar circumstances, and in fact did take us to war under similar circumstances. Trump, uh, to his credit, has uh, been much more careful about that. Now, look, I still wish he'd get us out of Yemen. I'm going to continue to push him on that, and uh, that's why I say I'm feeling the burn. Bernie and I invoked the War Powers Act successfully for the first time in the bills, uh, in the law's 46-year history earlier this year. Uh, Trump vetoed it. We tried to override the veto, and uh, we failed, but we're going to keep pushing on that. Yep. <clears throat> One of the big and large executive power over the last two administrations has been the unfettered use of executive orders. How do we put that genie back in the bottle? Yeah. Um, not all executive orders are, are created equal, of course. There are some executive orders that are well within the president's authority, statutorily and or constitutionally. Congress, if Congress gives the president the power to decide what time the lights are going to go on and off in the State Department, and the president issues an executive order exercising that power, there's nothing wrong with that. If, on the other hand, the president is engaging in the executive equivalent of emanating into the penumbra, then we got problems. And uh, so that's where it starts, really, is w with us looking at each exercise of power. But even upstream from that, is that we've got to stop giving such broad powers to presidents in the first place. It kind of uh, amuses me in a dark way to see um, my colleagues of both political parties, depending on who's in the Oval Office at the moment, complaining about the use of executive power when we give them that. We vote for all kinds of crazy crap. And I, I don't use that term lightly. That's, that's like really bad language where I come from. <laughs> Um, giving too much power to the executive. We, we've got to knock it off. Uh, this is why I routinely vote against things if they give too much discretion to the executive branch. Yep. Uh, so I, I'm in complete agreement with you that Article 2 has grown too large. I'm curious what <coughs> specific things you can propose to make it in the interest of congressmen and senators to actually legislate. Because right now it seems like with polarization at an all-time high, people resort to the highest level of abstraction at which they can find a common denominator when they go to pass a bill. At this point, you know, we vote for clean air is, is maybe a little too specific for some people. So how do you make it in the, in the interests of senators or congressmen so that their ambitions flow in the direction of, we're going to be detailed in our policy making? There has to be a big push, a populist push, ideally a a bipartisan populist push for a couple of reforms like the RAINS Act and the Global Trade Accountability Act. Uh, the Global Trade Accountability Act is my bill. The RAINS Act is a Rand Paul bill. Uh, the Global Trade Accountability Act does in the trade context what the RAINS Act does in the regulatory complex, uh, context, which is to say when the executive branch moves the goalpost, uh, when it rings, re-rings the legislative bell, that, uh, that policy may not take effect under the RAINS Act until such time as the, the major rule in question is run back through the filter of Congress and is passed affirmatively into law by the House and by the Senate and presented to the President for signature or veto. This, by the way, this is exciting. This is one of the few groups where I can uh, talk about my, my theory on this. My belief is that 
INS v. Chadha, taken to its logical conclusion, compels reforms like the Reins Act. In other words, in Chadha, the Supreme Court rejected the legislative veto, saying that it violates the presentment clause because it allows for a re-ringing of the legislative bell without bicameral passage and presentment to the president. If that is true in the context of the legislative veto, it ought also be true in the regulatory context when there is an affirmative legal obligation on the public, you know, as differentiated from deciding what time the lights go on and off in the State Department, for instance. Um, that changes the legislative status quo and it ought to require a vote by both houses of Congress. Incidentally, um, one of the people who I can plausibly credit for the idea underlying the Reins Act is James Landis. James Landis was a Harvard law professor, was a member of FDR's Brain Trust. And advi in advising FDR on the creation of the modern regulatory state, uh, Landis advised FDR that he really needed to run everything through Congress, that major, what we would today call major rules, economically significant regulations would have to go through. Anyway, getting back to your question as to how we make that appealing and compelling to political candidates, the only way is for there to be a popular outpouring of support for things like that. And for those who won't support the Reins Act, regardless of what political party or ideology they embrace, uh, needs to fear not embracing that. This is power to the people. And keeping the regulatory structure in place, detached and unaccountable from the people as it is, is maintaining a form of despotism. That's the only way we get there. We won't ever get there until people start seeing the true cost to them, to poor and middle class Americans, of the re modern regulatory state. All of this is policy agnostic. All of this is completely agnostic as to what the federal government ought to be doing. It's just a question of how it's done and who's accountable to whom. Yeah. Uh, uh, so my question is, uh, I've always been confused about these uh, nationwide court orders issued by district courts. I, I thought that district courts uh, can only issue orders that pertain to their district. So I wonder if you could uh, explain how that happened and when did that happen and is there any way that that could be reversed? Yeah. Um, this didn't used to happen very often. The, the way that it does happen uh, makes it a little tricky because a court has to have jurisdiction over the parties before it. When one of the parties before the court is a federal agency, is the federal government itself, in a sense, the court arguably has power over the entire country. Still, I would think that rules, uh, basic principles of um, restraint would and should compel the district court to avoid issuing a, an injunction that's broader than necessary. This didn't used to happen this way. District judges didn't used to purport to make their, their injunctions binding on the entire country. Um, I've wondered a lot about this and about what we could do to remedy it uh, legislatively. Could we, for instance, utilize our power under Article Three to limit the jurisdiction of the federal courts expressly so as to forbid a federal district judge from issuing a nationwide injunction or issuing an injunction that extends beyond the judicial district in question? I think that's probably uh, the best way we can solve it from our end. Yeah. In the event of a U.S. Supreme Court opening in the next, well, let's say the last year of President Trump's current term, what, what do you think would happen? Do you have any predictions on whether or not we could get another justice on the Supreme Court in this term? We'd fill it. We'd fill it. Um, uh, it'd be, there are a lot of people who would complain about it, but the, the, if it were to happen, in 2020, that is a situation in which the President's party controls the majority of the United States Senate. And in that circumstance, it's customary for the Senate to confirm the person. It's different where the Senate's under the control of uh, 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 a different political party uh, than the President. But yeah, we'd fill it. Quick follow-up, if I may. Mm -hmm. um, 
how do we go back to the old days when the Senate confirmation hearings of Supreme Court justices were the circus that we saw in the last? Restoring federalism and separation of powers would be a nice start. Look, this is the logical consequence of making everything federal. And it's the logical consequence of creating an illusion and in some cases a reality in which the Supreme Court is a policy making body. The reason that Supreme Court confirmations were not contentious in decades and centuries past was because the federal government was itself narrow in its focus and the Supreme Court in particular was something that many commentators observed at the time would make it perpetually uh, relatively meaningless. Now, this doesn't mean that you can roll back the clock to make it 1789 again. Maybe I should suggest now, never mind. Let's make America 17 now, it doesn't work. <laughs> um, but I think we can focus some of the political conversations on, on, on why it has to be that contentious. And the reason is we're, we, we, we tried to turn a, a sow's ear into a silk purse and it doesn't work. And the limit? Yeah, there, there, were, there was one over here somewhere and then we've got this guy. All right, all right, so these three. These two guys and then that guy. Go ahead. I've just never had the opportunity to ask a senator their opinion on the 17th Amendment before since you're talking about federalism and separation of powers. you think it was a good idea, bad idea? Has it contributed to the problem? There's no question that we lost something in 1913 when we adopted the 16th Amendment, the 17th Amendment, and created the Federal Reserve uh, and uh, welcomed Woodrow Wilson in as President of the United States. It's kind of a bad year in that respect. Um, there's no question that we lost something uh, from the original Constitution because no longer were the states represented as states in the sense that the state government was choosing them. It is my view that this is um, water under the bridge. Politically, I don't think you can unscramble that egg. There has too many metaphors. I had a law professor tell me don't mix metaphors in the same sentence or otherwise you'll end up saying things like our sacred cows are coming home to roost. You know? <laughs> okay, I called two other questions and they were over here somewhere, yeah. Uh, early in your career, you were very outspoken, sometimes controversially so, about the um, extreme risk you thought was posed by our national debt. Are you still as concerned now as you were in 2012 when I think? No, way more so. Way more concerned. Um, I looked today, just a couple of hours ago, at, at what the federal government spent servicing its debt last year. About $380 billion last year. That's a lot of money. And there, there are people right here in the Washington, D.C. area who don't make $380 billion in a whole year. Um, <laughs> but that's not the scary part. The scary part is that it's only that. And this isn't that much more than what we were spending 20 years ago when our debt was a small fraction of this, like one sixth of its current size. The only reason that it's only $380 billion a year, which by the way is I think more than the federal share of Medicaid, it's a big chunk of money. The only reason it's only that is because our treasury yield rates are at an all time historic low. So yeah, it scares me and the, 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 one of the many reasons it scares me is you think about what could happen, what will happen when at some point treasury yield rates, even assuming they don't rebound above the historical average in response to these artificially low levels. Just when they return to an historical average, we'll go in very short order, especially when you're considering that our debt portfolio now consists of a lot more shorter term debt instruments than in years past. In just a couple of years, we'll go from 380 billion a year to over a trillion a year in interest payments. Where's that six or 700 billion dollar difference going to come from? This on top of our already staggering annual deficit of about a trillion dollars a year. There is not a tax increase imaginable that could cover that shortfall. And if we tried, we would devastate the economy and bring in, end up bringing in less. So um, 
and yes, I am a broken record on this, the only way we ever get out of it is to start focusing on the fact that this was never supposed to be the Swiss Army knife of governments. It was never supposed to be everything to everybody. It was supposed to be a limited purpose vehicle, and we've ceased to use it as such. Okay, who's the, were you the, yeah. I think a lot of Americans would probably agree with you that sort of we should get back to a limited government and giving more power to the states. Can you talk a little bit more about how you put that into action, right? Are there specific government agencies you think we should get rid of? Department of Labor, the EPA, like are we just getting rid of these and giving all these powers back to the states or how do we do it? Yeah. <clears throat> I've gone back and forth on exactly what the tipping point is or how we would start it. I, I have come increasingly in recent years to believe that just as the deviation from federalism to the separation of powers occurred in a certain order. We had to rip the seal off of federalism in order to get to the point where we would mess with separation of powers to the degree that we have. I tend to believe that the reverse is also true in, 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 in the opposite order. If you start with separation of powers, you'll force the issue of federalism. Because if all of a sudden you had Congress having to vote in order to ratify or reject every major rule, then you'd have members of Congress actually having to own more or less the whole of the federal footprint and take accountability for that, which would cause members of Congress to begin wetting themselves, essentially. Uh, uh, and and you, you think I'm exaggerating. I'm, I'm not just wait and see when we get the RAINS Act passed someday. It's going to be awesome because all my colleagues are going to realize, oh my gosh, why are we in charge of so many things? Why is it that so many aspects of day-to-day -day existence of American citizens uh, should be decided by this government? We're a vast, diverse nation where there are very significant uh, regional preferences based on culture, tradition, history, and just uh, uh, local economic differences. People in Utah don't necessarily want the same kind of government they have in Vermont, and that's just fine. But um, anyway, if you, if you bring about a restoration of federalism, which you would inevitably do by passing the RAINS Act, it's going to put pressure on federalism, and that's where it will inevitably lead. That's why if I had just one legislative shot to fire, if there were one piece of proposed legislation that I would pass, if given the chance to do it, it would be the RAINS Act because it would force us back into that position. Think about this. From, from the time we created the modern administrative regulatory state uh, during the New Deal era until INS v. Chadha, the Supreme Court had adopted literally hundreds of legislative veto provisions. Congress deep down wanted to keep its foot in the door. Congress deep down knew that it was wrong to give unlimited legislative powers to the executive branch. And so that's why in, in, in hundreds of instances, I think there were about 450 of them on the books, uh, by the time Chadha was decided in 1983, Congress had, had said, but yeah, we get the last word. If uh, agency or department or division or commission, uh, such and such, says something we don't like, we can undo it. And there was some good reason for this, but one, the Supreme Court made clear, and I, and I think the court got it right in Chadha, that that was unconstitutional. A lot of people thought that the excessive delegation would stop and probably reverse itself, or at least slow down. But what has happened since 1983? Well, I, most of you weren't born and wouldn't be born for several years after that, but if anything, Congress has accelerated into the turn. Congress has accelerated its delegation of powers, thus frustrating and proving wrong Madison's assumption that each branch would instinctively combat encroachments by the other two, and that power would thus be made to counteract power, one branch to another. The one part that I think he didn't anticipate was that there would come a time in which people would aspire to become more or less career federal politicians, and that the 
aspiration of achieving de facto perpetual incumbent status as a federal lawmaker would offset the instinct to defend power from one's own branch of government. I also think he didn't foresee the extent to which we would neglect and deviate from the principle of federalism. Those two things combined uh, uh, frustrated the, 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 the core of his basic assumption about how separation of powers would work. Um, so I think we can get there. But there is going to have to be a concerted effort to push it back. And I, and I really think it all starts with passing basic reforms like the RAINS Act. And let me just close with this pitch. If you are a liberal Democrat, or a Democrat of any stripe, if you're anything other than a, a knuckle-dragging, uh, libertarian-leaning, conservative Republican like me, but especially if you're a liberal, if you're a progressive, you should want to restore federalism and separation of powers. If you are a liberal Democrat, the thought of this president in particular being in power and having that much power through the executive branch ought to terrify you. Now, it, it, it terrifies me far less to have a conservative Republican in the White House than it does a liberal Democrat because a conservative Republican typically will want to exercise that power less. But for the exact same reason, you as a liberal Democrat might feel the opposite way, and in fact, you should. So, and if you're a Republican, um, it ought to mortify you for other reasons, that we've taken that much power to the federal government and given that much of it to the executive branch. Regardless of your political persuasion, I invite you to join me in this cause. Let's bring it back. Don't fall for the canard that this is tantamount to a request that we return to 1789. It's nonsense. We're not going to do that. There's no basis for doing that. There's no need to do that. The Constitution is itself sufficiently malleable and pliable so as to adjust to modern technologies and economic conditions, allowing us to regulate not just the bare commercial interstate transactions, but also channels and instrumentalities of interstate commerce, including those not foreseen in 1787 or in 1789 or 1791. Interstate airways, airwaves, waterways, and so forth, things that they couldn't have and didn't imagine then. But the Founding Fathers saw the possibility that things would come along that they didn't anticipate. They were not dumb. And they understood that there was a connection between local economic activity and uh, interstate commerce generally. They did not, in fact, at any point intend to or use language that could reasonably be construed to give Congress plenary legislative authority over in any and every economic activity that when measured in the aggregate would have a substantial effect on interstate commerce. In my mind, it all comes back down to that. Do we want to live as a free people? Do we want to claim that which is rightfully ours? That is the right to live in a land where no one person or no one group of people acquires too much power? Or do we want to not do it? I think it's time for us to embrace that choice. It's time for us to restore and expect freedom. Thank you.